Hello, my name is Lorna Slade. Um, I'm the technical advisor from Wambao Coastal Community Network. Wambao is a small NGO working in Tanzania, but based in Zanzibar. And um, during this talk, I would like to share with you our experiences over the last six years of octopus management with communities in Zanzibar. Um, Wambao Coastal Community Network is a small NGO, as I've said, and our vision is thriving coastal communities living in a sustainably managed, healthy marine ecosystem. Uh, we work with three underlying values, um, equity, empowerment and stewardship. In 2015, we engaged with two partners, the Indian Ocean Commission Smart Fish Project and Fauna and Flora International to introduce the first contemporary reef closures for Zanzibar, for octopus that is. Um, and today I want to talk to you about our experiences over the last six years in doing that. Just to set the scene, um, small scale fisheries in the developing world provide a key source of micronutrients and protein for over a billion low income consumers, according to FAO. Their importance and contribution is often estimated as we know. In the developing world, small scale fisheries are often operating in a resource poor environment. And here I'm referring to both financial and human resources for management. While legislation itself might be supportive for sustainable local management, fisheries departments often lack resources for community governance training and effective law enforcement over the large, often large marine areas involved. Thus community confidence and knowledge is generally low for engaging in management. In Tanzania overall, artisanal fishing contributes anywhere from 90 to 100% of all fisheries landings. Artisanal fisheries in Zanzibar are mainly undertaken in the shallow coastal waters, encompassing coral reef habitats, mangrove creeks, seagrass beds and sandbanks. In Zanzibar, the number of people involved in artisanal fishing is estimated around 150,000. <clears> of the total fishers in the 2016 frame survey, about 150,000 of those or 30% were foot fishers and more than half of those are women. Village level fisher committees, or SFCs as we know them, are the lowest level of local governance and are appointed by and accountable to re respective villages and landing sites. And these are the committees with whom we work together with the Government Department for Fisheries Development. We know that we do not have an inexhaustible supply of marine resources and thus continued open access um, has, has been the case, is not an option. The situation has deteriorated rapidly in the last 50 years with the availability of new gears, improved boats and engines <clears throat> and occasional commercial fleets. In Zanzibar, a rapidly increasing human population has led to an expansion in the number of fishers and hence fishing effort and there is broad agreement that overfishing of stocks is occurring throughout. However, fishing is a way of life and there are few alternative income generations or activities. Octopus is caught commonly and it is estimated that 99% of all octopus caught in Zanzibar is the big blue octopus, octopus cyanide. Both men and women are involved in the fishery with women largely operating on foot in intertidal areas and a large number of men snorkeling in subtidal areas. Although most of the fishing activity is carried out in shallow waters near shore, the fishery increasingly is using vessels as a means to access distant offshore reef patches. Foot fishers use sticks, rebars, hand spears and hook sticks on the near shore fringing reef. Men snorkeling over the reef crest use a spear gun or spear. The fishery is highly selective and therefore offers the implementation of limits on numbers, sizes and times of the year as a means of control. Some areas already show signs of overexploitation, indicated by the reduced number of animals and smaller sizes and weights. The use of scuba diving to target octopus opens up the deeper water part of the stock as well as breeding individuals and this threatens the resilience of the stock in response to high fishing pressure in shallow waters. On the positive, there has been an active export market, but there are no fish or octopus processing plants in Zanzibar. All octopus catch is shipped to either Tanga or Dar es Salaam on the mainland.
why do small scale octopus fisheries present an opportunity? Well, in southern Zanzibar, a system of octopus closures to increase yields is not new. There were closed seasons for octopus historically, and these were timed to coincide with religious holidays. More recently, temporary closures for octopus have been established across other countries in the Western Indian Ocean and have proved successful due to the biological characteristics of octopus themselves. For example, in Madagascar, Blue Ventures in 2018 reported over 300 closures, as well as 70 locally managed marine areas covering 17% of the island's inshore seabed. In Rodrigues, a two month island wide seasonal closure has been established since 2012. In Mauritius, following the example of Rodrigues, a countrywide two month closure has been established between August and October every year. Over the last three years, visitors from Comoros and Kenya, as well as mainland Tanzania, have visited Zanzibar to learn about closures and have now also started to implement them. Octopus cyanea has some important uh, characteristics in its biology that need to be considered as part of the fishery management. It's a short-lived species. Its lifespan is approximately 18 months. Females spawn once in their lifetime and die soon after the larvae hatch, around 30 days after spawning. Males also die shortly after mating. The female must brood her eggs for successful hatching, and thus there is a need to stop or reduce fishing pressure during this time. Once hatched, the free swimming larvae are vulnerable to local currents and only settle on nearby reef after about 30 days. There may be a significant distance. This may be a significant distance from where they hatched. Because females begin to spawn at about two and a half kilos size, fishing of large individuals can affect recruitment and stock size. A reduction in octopus size and weight is already seen in heavily fished areas and this possibly affects reproductive output. On this slide, you can just see um, a portion of a comic book produced in Swahili explaining about the octopus life cycle that we used in our work. As I've said, it's a fast growing species, gaining as much as 200 grams in 10 days. And the results of management are detected quickly. And this is an opportunity. Um, as you can see from this uh, small poster in Swahili, if you um, start with an octopus of uh, 200 grams at, at three months, um, by the time it reaches 18 months, if it hasn't been fished, it, it can reach as much as 12.8 kilos. That's very rapid growth. As I said, in Zanzibar, there's been a market from both tourism and exports, at least up until this year. Um, and the octopus fishery represents a valuable source of cash income for both men and women fishers. Uh, revenue from management can also be raised locally using a levy on landings. And I'll talk more about this later. There are several possible management measures for the octopus fishery. One is a minimum or maximum size limit. And under the 1988 Fisheries Act, it was illegal to catch land or possess octopus that were under 30 centimeters in total length. However, this was difficult to implement as it's not easy to estimate octopus size when they're in a den. Under the updated 2010 Fisheries Act, no size limits are mentioned. Other possible management measures are gear restrictions, such as use of spear guns or scuba. And actually, both of these gears are banned in the current Fisheries Act. However, the most effective management measure is thought to be temporary reef closures. We use a series of criteria that we um, use when we guide a community in, in the introduction of a closure. Um, the area must be known for octopus, and it must include significant areas of reef. Um, an area that's selected should be patrollable with relative ease and low expense, i.e. it should be relatively accessible from the village. The area should ideally include deeper water reef refuge areas, which are suitable for breeding. Breeding dens are thought to occur in water depths of more than five meters. Um, we recommend that the area is not more than 10 to 20% of the community's entire fishing ground but ideally it does not measure less than 100 hectares. Uh, the, the area ideally should be predominantly used by the village rather than uh, neighbors. And we recommend a closure of two to three months minimum. When the area is opened, there can be a series of harvesting rules in terms of access numbers of fishes, for example, or octopus size or allowable gear. 
The pattern of closures can vary in, in type depending on what is best for the community. Closures can be a rolling closure where the area is only open for a few days and then closed again. Rotational closures can also be used when different parts of the fishing ground are closed in rotation. It is also possible just to have one period of closure per year. This decision should be made in conjunction with the community, but should take into account social and biological considerations. In one village in Pember, there have been repeat octopus closures every three months for the last five and a half years. This is a poster that we use. Um, we produce it in English and Kiswahili and it explains the steps for establishing a clo closure. The print is quite small, so I won't try to read it to you. However, it, it just shows that um, we start with site selection um, and we use community meetings to explain why this type of management works for octopus. And then we start on a series of capacity building and collection of baseline information in the community. And then we start the adaptive management cycle, which includes establishing local bylaws, awareness raising with the community and neighbors, um, deciding the period of closing, uh, instituting monitoring of the catch, uh, demarcation of the area, and following a closure, carrying out a participatory data analysis, and then hopefully re-engaging in the adaptive management cycle. Um, as I mentioned, catch monitoring is uh, indicated because it informs governance, certainly the first few times around. Um, we usually use kitchen scales, as you see here, um, because they go down to um, 25 grams. Um, the map at the bottom shows you um, an area, some areas of closure in Pemba. And um, as you see, we can get very big octopus uh, after a closure. Um, this one is eight kilograms, which is quite unusual. Um, the areas, these closure areas have been described as octopus banks. Um, and I think it's quite a valid term. Um, they uh, act as a bank in a situation where it's often very difficult to save. So what are other prerequisites for the closure to be successful? And it, it's worth considering what we mean by success in this context. It could mean that the closure runs the full course of two or three months. It might mean the patrol is adequate. It might mean that fishers agree to pay the levy. It might mean that landings are very high. It might mean, might mean all of these things. But as I said, informed governance is critical. So catch monitoring at least the first few times around is important. Uh, by laws should be in place and should be enforced. Um, patrol has to be effective. And very importantly, transparent and equitable sharing of any revenue raised is very, very important. And this can undermine um, any initiative that's taken if it's not carried out properly. Communication is very important, both uh, to authorities and to fishers themselves. And for a good harvest, the weather has to be conducive on harvest days. Um, if you have rough seas, you can't see the octopus in their dens and therefore the uh, harvest will be low. Main threat to octopus closures is from poaching, night fishing, weak enforcement and vandalism or stealing of the demarcation buoys. Um, this is just uh, to demonstrate um, factors that can influence success of a closure and, and factors that have to be borne in mind. So we start off, as we said, with the local institution, which can be a fishers committee or a beach management unit. Um, we then carry out institutional training, um, which looks at conflict management, looks at financial management, looks at patrol planning, implementation of bylaws and so on. Then we embark on uh, the management cycle. And the first thing obviously is to, to make a decision, decision about the closure. So we have to go through stakeholder consultation regarding the size of the area, where it's going to be, how long it's going to be closed, whether it's be going to be closed for all species or just for octopus, uh, what gear is going to be allowed when opening and that kind of thing. And this is very important uh, stage so that everybody's informed. And then we get to the implementation of the closure itself. And there are a number of factors that can influence what happens during that closure. And that can be based on the technical advice, for example, that was given in the first place on the location and the habitat involved and the timing. It can um, be influenced by the catch monitoring itself, whether it's been designed properly. It can be influenced by how the opening protocol 
um, takes place? Who's going to have access? Is everybody going to have access or just a few? Is there going to be a catch levy? Are the bylaws effective? Are they designed well? Is the patrol um, well designed? Is there any other form of support? Once the uh, closure has been implemented, um, then of course we have to uh, quantify the results. And again, there's a number of ways in which those results can be quantified. We can look at the price on the day of opening. We can look at the revenue gains. We can look at how that revenue is shared, whether it's shared between the community and the patrol committee. We can measure um, the results by catch in kilograms. We can measure the total number of octopus. We can measure the catch per unit effort or the average size. We can also look at the impact on livelihoods or we can measure the number of infringements, for example. But the important point is how these communicate, how these results are then communicated to stakeholders, because then that influences the level of satisfaction and community trust uh, that, that that exists then between the local institution, the uh, fishers committee or the BMU, and the community of fishers themselves. If everything goes well, we would hope for a repeat cycle. Um, community benefits. Um, of course, we expect harvest results and bigger and more plentiful octopus. And we also hope that uh, the, any revenue has been declared and used equitably, both for to cover the committee costs, but also for development initiatives. All villages that have engaged in closures have adopted a catch levy on opening days. Um, this might be 25 cents to 50 cents on top of a price range of 1.9 to 2.3 dollars per kilo. This enables the Fisher Committee to cover some of their costs and also to contribute to village development initiatives, such as improvements to the school, the health clinic and so on. The use of this revenue is very important as it can provide very visible community benefits as a result of the closure that everybody can see. Um, fishing patterns in the octopus fishery can be described based on the tides, which obviously is controlled by the lunar cycle. Uh, depending on the location of the fishing ground, the number of fishing days can range from 16 days a month in more traditional areas to a full month in areas where skin diving is common. Mambao, along with the Department of Fisheries, trains local village personnel to record octopus landings. We employ on a part-time basis over 54 recorders who collect catch data for 10 to 16 days a month over the two spring tide periods. This is just a quick summary of our data from 2015 to 2019. I won't go through it all, but uh, we've recorded over 84,000 individual catches. We've weighed uh, over 249,000 octopus. Um, and all the data has been cleaned up to September and we've started to look, in, look at it um, in our studio. This is just um, a quick uh, summary of some of the results for one village showing the benefits. Um, when a um, closure has taken place, we usually carry out a participatory analysis exercise with the community and we look at two parameters, which is easy for them to comprehend and to uh, chart out themselves. First thing is the average total catch per day in kilograms for the spring tide period. And that's the top graph you can see. And then the bottom graph shows average octopus weight in grams. On the graph, um, the bottom axis shows the years and months, or lunar months, and um, we have kilos or uh, grams on the left-hand side. The orange bars are the closed periods and the blue bars represent open times. You can see quite obviously that uh, the average total catch increases quite dramatically more than half in general. I mean, sorry, more than twice in general um, after opening. And importantly, on average octopus weight, <clears throat> on average, you can see that um, in this village of Cuckoo, weights are between 400 and 600 grams per individual. But after uh, a closure, they can raise as high as uh, 1,300 1, grams. This is very important because, as we said earlier, um, we need larger octopus in, in order for them to be able to reproduce. Um, this is the team in Cuckoo. Um, they chart the um, bar charts out by hand, um, and then they use them to uh, explain the impact of the closures to the community. 
as well as to the Department of Fisheries. This is a summary of some of the data we've collected so far from all the villages that we've been implementing closures. Um, this is just a simple graph showing weight class of octopus and the number of octopus caught by men and women. Female fishers are shown in the orange pink um, bar and male fishers are shown by the green bar. Um, you can see that the majority of octopus are caught in the zero to 500 grams um, category and 500 to 1000 gram category. And the vast majority of these are caught by men. Um, so this has ecological and social implications. The next graph shows um, just the number of octopus caught in each size category. Again, the weight class is at the bottom. You can see that 48% of all octopus caught were less than 500 grams. Sorry, I should say that the pink bar or orange bar is uh, for Pemba Island and the blue bar is for Unguja Island. Um, this chart is important because um, we know that the minimum mean weight for sexual maturity in octopus cyanide for males is 640 grams and for females is 2,500 grams. So you can see that a very small portion of uh, the population that's been fished um, actually reaches um, a size of sexual maturity. So what are the additional benefits? Um, firstly, governance has been improved of the Village Fisheries Committee. Secondly, management knowledge and confidence has increased. Thirdly, benefits of management have been proven. And lastly, the ability of the Fisheries Committee has been demonstrated both to the community, but also to the government. We do have to keep in mind other considerations, however, when introducing a, a closure. Um, we have to bear in mind that a closure in an area where there aren't closures with the neighbours, for example, can attract more people into the fishery. Um, both within the community themselves, people who've never fished octopus before, but also neighbours, as well as those who come to camp from further away. This can lead to conflict. Um, there are also misconceptions over expectations for other species at opening, um, sorry, um, yeah, for other species. We know that short closures are not suitable for all species, it's especially reef fish. Um, elite capture is possible and the lack of accountability and transparency, transparency with revenue can undermine the initiative. This is a very important point. Um, and intense fishing pressure on opening can lead to trampling. Um, at opening of no, temporary no-take zones, there can be upwards of 600 fishers in one area. Studies in Rodrigues, for example, have shown that trampling can result in a marked reduction in coral cover, severely reducing octopus habit, habitat. So small-scale octopus fisheries, is this an opportunity for co-management? Collaborative management um, is typically defined as a partnership arrangement between government and the local community of resource users to share the responsibility and authority for management of a closure. Collaborative management can mean a range of approaches and uh, there's a scale of involvement of all of the stakeholders involved. We like to refer to community-based collaborative management with an emphasis on the community role, but supported by government, of course. This approach is particularly important for small-scale fisheries where governments struggle to provide the management capacity and responsibility needed for the large coastal areas involved. Successful operation of reef closures for octopus can pave the way for wider marine habitat planning, management planning. We can start to um, consider other habitats such as uh, mangroves, coral reefs, seagrass beds. We can also consider priority food species, endangered species, and so on. By measuring the results and continuing to loop back, we can refine management on a regular basis. And there are other activities, there's a wider context which we shouldn't forget. Other activities can influence the results of adaptive management and it's worth mentioning them here as they can play a significant role. We can look at the market system. Uh, together with FFI, we've looked at participatory market system development in some of our villages. Um, there can be community conservation loans. This is something that we've introduced in uh, several villages together with green fi systems. 
And these are loans that are accessible, um, compliant on following the management plan. We can look at value addition. We can work with the tourism uh, sector to incentivize sustainable management. And we may look at implementing other community development projects. On top of this, um, having started uh, successful co-management at the village level, there's scope for groups of villages to work together and there's many advantages of working as a collaborative management group. Patrol costs can be shared, um, a boat can be shared, the crew can be mixed, this decreases the costs, the bylaws can be harmonised and they can be supported by enforcement agencies such as the Coast Guard and um, joint conservation targets can be met together. And also this arrangement can help with conflict um, management. So temporary reef closures for octopus do provide an entry point for co-management as they give an opportunity to strengthen fishery com committee capacity to establish good governance. Um, once the community has seen the benefits originating from octopus closures and the committee has the skills for management, the opportunity exists for further co-management initiatives leading to a local management plan for all resources. There is, however, the need for a, commi a commitment to all collaborative. There is, however, the need for a commitment to a collaborative management approach at all levels of governance, including the government department responsible to enable progress. Bylaws must be endorsed, and enforcement agencies must follow through with cases brought forward by the community. Management of marine conservation areas and a resource-poor environment relies on local management approaches. This is just showing um, one of the first local management plans um, in the Pemba Channel conservation area. You can see that they've adopted a zoning approach with a permanent no-take zone, a temporary no-take zone, areas for seaweed farming, um, sandbank areas for tourism, and so on. Working collaboratively, there's also an opportunity for a larger scale fisheries approach, for example, shared initiatives and the closing of contiguous reefs, for example, and more expensive areas. This is um, the first collaborative management group for Zanzibar has been established in South Pemba and consists of four different communities. We do not have a complete date data set yet, but we estimate that the implementation of temporary closures for octopus have brought revenue of at least $21,000 in catch levies to village fisher committees and communities over the last five years. This works out to roughly about $920 per year per community. In a resource poor community, this is not insignificant and it gives significant encouragement to communities uh, for what they're able to achieve. These numbers do not include the increased catch and revenue experienced by individual fishers as a result of closures. In the current worldwide push for the blue economy, there are concerns expressed by small scale fisher groups that the agenda runs a significant risk of undervaluing social objectives and benefiting only a few. It is feared that this push may threaten the basic need for providing both livelihoods and affordable, nutrient-rich food for those who need it most. Believing that co-management is the way forward in a resource-poor artisanal fishery, our work has demonstrated to us that we need to do our best to document the true economic and social impact of short-term octopus closures as a management op option, to demonstrate to decision makers the real value of a community-based collaborative management approach to both local and national economies. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. This is the end of my presentation. I would like to finish off with a short one minute video from the octopus fishers of Zanzibar, telling you a little bit about the, their experiences of uh, reef closures for octopus. Thank you very much. Ulilili fata kutokana na wazee wetu. Mshakubali nyinyi jamii. Kuna taasisi husika ambazo kwa idara husika tuzipite tuandike barua kuomba maeneo haya hifadhi. Haikukaa tu kamati ikasema kwamba siye kama kamati ni kwamba tuweke sheria ndogo ndogo. Ni kwamba tunaweka kila baada ya miezi mitatu. Tunafunga kweza wetu. Bila kuwa na doria masa 24 tulicho kihifadhi basi hatuto kivuna uzuri kwa sababu wahalifu watatumia wakati ule. Pesa zinapopatikana zile katika maeneo yetu tunao hifadhi tunagawa mafungu matatu. 
asilimia thalathini za kamati, asilimia thalathini za jamii na asilimia arubaini za walinzi. Thank you very much for listening. This is the end of my presentation. I hope you found it interesting. I know there was a lot of information there, uh, but I look forward to chatting further in the Q&A uh, session later in the week. Um, and meanwhile, do feel free to contact me for any clarifications or further information. Thanks very much.